Welcome to our next session. A couple of quick notes before we start. Keynotes, 2 p.m. in this room. And also, if you have a chance to fill out the surveys, they really give us a lot of value. And if you collect six, you're eligible for a prize at Swag Central. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Roberto Bamberger. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, it's a little bit scary being in this room. It's a big room. So my name is Roberto Bamberger. I'm a senior principal consultant on the Microsoft Incident Response Team. We are the customer-facing arm of Microsoft when customers are having a bad day. Uh, what I'm going to share with you today, even though I'm the speaker, this is really the results of a whole lot of collaboration with a lot of, uh, a lot of different folks across both our Microsoft IR team and then the broader Microsoft security community. So I just want to make sure that I'm just representing what this team collaborative has done and not trying to take all the credit for it. Um, you know, the older you get, the, less, the more we become reliant on people a whole lot smarter than us. So, and one of them is actually in the front over here, Thomas Volstick, and I just butchered his name. Uh, Thomas and I are presenting on a different session tomorrow, so please come by for that. So this particular CVE gained a whole lot of attention. Uh, there was a vulnerability in Microsoft Outlook, the rich Outlook Windows client, which effectively enabled threat actors to send poisoned messages which would trigger an NTLM hash leak out to threat actor controlled infrastructure with very little user action required. All the user had to do was open Outlook. They didn't have to click on a message. They didn't have to click on a link. They didn't even have to open the message. And what started off for me, you know, of, gosh, it's right before Christmas. I'm ready to take some time off. It had been a rough year. Anybody in incident response, it's always a rough year. But we hope that it'll slow down. And, you know, I get this message saying, hey, we've got kind of a weird one. Should be short. That was the other thing. But could you take a look? I said, sure. Um, so we had, a, we had a government customer. And even though I'm not allowed to say who the customer is, I can say that the Ukrainian CERT was credited with helping find this vulnerability. And one of their customer organizations was seeing some strange behavior in their on-prem exchange servers. And they reached out to their CERT, and their CERT said, you know, why don't we ask Microsoft? This is an exchange server thing. We're looking at some telemetry. We don't really understand what it is, you know, what it's trying to tell us, other than we think that somebody's doing something weird where they're accessing, they log in with one account and are accessing other people's emails. Okay. I was like, hey, there's like five ways that that could happen. No problem. We'll figure this thing out. We'll be done by Christmas. So that was the initial beginning of this. How is user A authenticating, but can view user B's mail? So I said, OK. And the customer and their CERT partner, Ukrainian CERT, wanted some help in interpreting the values in Exchange server logs. The good part here is the customer actually had logs, right? How many of us in incident response, you know, you show up, you roll up to a customer, and there's just no data? Right? There's no historic data, the logs have rolled, the threat actors deleted them, whatever. Um, here we actually had lots of logs. We probably had too many logs, to be quite honest. Um, but So one of the first things we wanted to answer was this very technical question of how was user A authenticating but able to access these other mailboxes? And I was like, oh, well, there's really three ways in Exchange Server that you can do that. Application impersonation role. You can change the mailbox permissions, or you can have overly permissive mailbox permissions. 
and a little bit more subtle, but hopefully most people in this room know about it, is I can also change mailbox folder permissions. So we looked at application impersonation. That was not in play here. Mailbox permissions, they looked OK for the affected users. Then we had to go through the painful process of enumerating for each mailbox, each folder under each mailbox, and looking at the effective permissions. So we did that. And sure enough, the affected mailboxes, somebody had changed the permissions so that any authenticated user could access that mailbox as owner. Inside of Exchange Server, um, there's this user that we call default. <laughs> there's another built-in user that we call anonymous. And what we, if you actually see mailbox folder permissions, where the default user has any privileges, the technical term for it is that's weird. Okay? And if you look at all of the mailbox folders within a mailbox, and they've all been changed, that's really weird. Because typically, the way you would change the mailbox folder permissions is in the GUI, you would right click on that mailbox. And you'd say, oh, I need to share my calendar with my administrative assistant, right? And so I say, oh, give them delegate access to my calendar. Or I'm working on a project with Thomas. I'm going to share this project folder with Thomas. Nobody normally will say, I'm going to change it so default user. And default means any authenticated user. That's not really well documented anywhere. So great, we see that the mailbox folder permissions have been changed. Next question was, who changed them and when? How long has this been going on? And the other thing was, um, oh yeah, how did the threat actor authenticate in as user A and then use these privileges where any authenticated user could access user B, C, D, E, and F, right? So we were a little confused by that. Some, so we wrote a custom script using the Exchange Web Services API to pull back from that Exchange server the last modification timestamp for the mailbox folder object. One of the actions you can take on a mailbox folder that will change the last modification timestamp is changing the mailbox folder permissions. There are a whole bunch of other actions. But when we looked at that, some of those mailbox folder, some of the last modified permission, mailbox, um, the last modified timestamp for the mailbox folders went all the way back to 2021. There was also a whole bunch of activity in pockets of 2022. But we believe that some, a threat actor had been in this customer's environment before as early as 2021. So there's an old saying in medical school. They say, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. I use this a lot when we teach our analysts you know, how we do hunting across you know, our Microsoft IR team. And really what this meant in the medical school thing was that first year medical students and things like that, when they're doing their residency, when they're doing their rotations, they tend to, you know, gosh, this person's sneezing and, you know, it must be some big exotic disease. So initially we were thinking, hey, it's a government agency, they're in the middle of a war, they're running Exchange Server 2013, some of those boxes, they're probably not patching them. So our initial thought was, there's no Vuln here, or there's no zero day here. I'm sure that their exchange servers weren't patched. We got disk images of all their exchange servers. We looked at them. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, these guys patched within two days of us issuing a patch for Exchange Server, and they've been doing it religiously for the last two years. So then we said, well, all right. There's, you know, we've dealt with proxy logon, proxy shell, proxy not shell. A lot of these were basically server-side um, request forgeries, right? Uh, vulnerabilities that were discovered back in, I believe, 2021. We're like, well, do we see anything else? Maybe there's another SSRF bug. Couldn't find anything that looked like exploitation of the Exchange server. So it's recently patched. Um, we looked for compromise indicators. There's no web shells on that box. There's no weird logins. There's nothing. The exchange servers were behind a proxy. So they had an IIS proxy. They gave us the logs from the IIS proxy. I had one of my colleagues take those logs, parse them, and shove them into our big data platform, which is called Cousteau, or Azure Data Explorer. Sitting underneath Azure Data Explorer, which is the same technology which we use in the Microsoft Log Analytics product, the Microsoft Sentinel product, advanced hunting in Defender 365. So it's kind of our lingua franca for dealing with big data. We ingest all of this and we start looking at those proxy logs and we see some interesting stuff. There's a brute force password spray going over Exchange ActiveSync using basic auth. Um, which really does show me that one of the things that this threat actor was doing was doing password sprays. But they were kind of interesting password sprays. Um, they're using basic auth, so the encryption there isn't really strong. When you look in the IIS proxy logs, um, you just do a base64 decode okay, on the input. Great, I get the username and password. So I see all the usernames and passwords that are coming in. And I see, well, when it's the threat actor doing it, they're enumerating through all 514 accounts with the same password. Then they change passwords, they go through all four, 514 accounts again. And they keep doing that over and over again. Eventually, they get an account, and we can also see the password patterns, right, that the users are entering, because the customer did use Exchange ActiveSync for some of their legitimate users. So the threat actor had intimate knowledge of that because they were trying variations and enumerations of, well, bad passwords. You know, something bang 2021. Then they had to change them every 90 days. So, you know, spring 2021, fall 2020, right? All those kind of variations, very simple passwords. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of successful authentication there. But then we started seeing these NTLM-based authentications. And one of my coworkers said, hey, we should go crack that open. And somehow, even though Thomas wasn't assigned to this engagement, I guess he was bored. And he said, well, OK, well, I'll, I'll take a look at that. That looks interesting. So he goes and looks up some articles about how to parse out this string that was getting sent to us. And he was able to write in KQL for me something which extracted out the username, the domain, and the workstation name. And all of a sudden, what we started seeing was user Bob coming from Bob's workstation from an IP address, not in the Ukraine, but in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we're like, huh, I don't think that the customer is sending, you know, going through some weird proxy that egresses through Utah. Maybe that's threat actor infrastructure. So how are they doing this? Well, this sounds like an NTLM relay attack, right? Because I'm taking an NTLM hash and I'm replaying it but embedded in that NTLM hash was the workstation name. And the workstation name was the user's legitimate workstation. So we started 
digging and digging at this, but the first, the next big clue that we had is we had the IP address from this data center in Utah. So we said, all right, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm a lazy analyst or an efficient analyst. You can view it either way. So I pushed the easy button. I said, hey, let me just go look up that IP address in all of my OSINT sources, including things like VirusTotal. So I look it up in, I, in VirusTotal, and I had a couple of them. And when I look at VirusTotal, what I saw there was really kind of interesting. And I'll be 100% honest, I missed it the first time. Here I'm showing you the files referring, but I didn't notice that at first. I was just like looking at files communicating with it. So I was looking at malware samples, right? My colleague Rocky DeWeist, who was working on the engagement with me, is like, hey, did you notice these files referring? Great, let's, hey, those look like email messages. Oh yeah. And the customer mentioned something about meeting invites. You know, people were getting these weird meeting invites, is what they told us. Huh, maybe we should look at that. So what we did is I had one of our malware analysts go download those messages, and he started tearing it apart. We'll show you a little bit more of that. But you'll notice there is my threat actor IP included in one of those forward message things, but it's in some weird data structure. So I was like, what is that? So one of our malware analysts started tearing it apart, and he said, oh, there's this weird property that's getting set here. And we're like, how does that get set? Now, every week, our colleagues in the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center, trying to look through the room, but I'm staring into spotlight, so I don't see if any of them are here. Um, a lot of them are based out here, here in DC. We have a, a team that focuses on Russian threat actors, and we have, a, we have a weekly call. And we just share what we're doing, and I said, hey, I'm working on this Ukraine thing. It's probably Russia. And I said, oh, and we found this weird message. So one of the analysts from, the, from that call, about five minutes later, says, um, yeah, there's about 10 more victim organizations, because some of the victim organizations were submitting these messages to VirusTotal. And we see them going back all the way to like, you know, Oh, what time? Yeah, 2023. So, you know, February of 2023, we see these messages. We download all of them. My colleagues in the Threat Intelligence Center, that's the group that does attribution to actors. They do what I call watching exploit TV. Okay? At this point, we knew, we, we knew enough to say, hey, there's something weird here. We think there's a vulnerability somewhere. We hadn't completely identified the vulnerability as being in the Outlook web or in the Outlook Windows client yet. But we did see this, and after a couple of phone calls, this is the beginning of January now, you know, reached out to my friends in office and said, hey, we have something here which triggers what we call a SIRP, S-S-I-R-P, Software and Services Incident Response Program. So we went from five analysts working on this engagement initially, then having Thomas and two of our devs down in Australia helping us out, so then we were at eight. Then I had the Mystic RU team, so we're at 11 people, and an hour and a half later, I'm on a call with 370 people across the whole of Microsoft. <laughs> We realized something bad was happening. We had not done a tr attribution to the threat actor yet. Mystic was working on that piece. But now we have the whole of Microsoft looking at this. So luckily, my, our reverse engineer took the sample from VirusTotal and said, hey, 
this all has to deal with this thing we call TNEF files. Transport Neutral Encapsulation Format. Right, that's a mouthful for you. What is TNEF? Well, when Microsoft wrote our own email server and client, there were these standards out there for how email works, like SMTP and email formats and MIME and everything else. But what if we wanted the client to do something beyond what you know, the standard supported? We would like to extend the standard, right? So in addition to MAPI, the Mail Access Protocol Interface, right? Microsoft did extended MAPI properties, and when you send an email, it'll send along this attachment. The email is actually sent as plain text, but if you want to send RTF or a formatted email, right, and things like that, that's actually sent in an attachment typically called winmail.dat. That is then parsed by, and that's basically that attachment is the description of the message with all of these rich properties in transport neutral encapsulation format. And within the transport neutral encapsulation format, we found this one property that was being set, um, which is called you know, the PID lid file, remand, file reminder parameter. And we're like, well, what is that? Okay, so the threat actor was sending specially crafted messages which in the TNEF file had this value set. What does that value do? That value allows you, as the end user, to say, hey, when it, my wife assigns me a task, I want it to make a different sound than the normal system sound, so I know that it's a task from her, so I can customize the sound that plays. This thing was intended to only be able to be set by the end user in the Outlook client. It turns out that there's no control to stop some arbitrary person from sending, setting that parameter in a message they send you. Okay, and I can include a path to that file I could have a web dev path, I can have, you know, an HTTP URI. I can also just have an SMB file path to a server outside of my organization, right? Just anywhere out on the internet. So what was happening was the threat actor was sending these specially crafted messages to their target victims as long as the person's using the Outlook email client on a Windows client, did not affect, we, we checked. Doesn't affect the Mac client, doesn't affect the Android client, doesn't affect anything else, just the rich Windows client. Doesn't affect Outlook web access, okay? But it did affect the Windows client. So the threat actor was sending these messages to basically saying, hey, go now, go try to play this file. Well, when I try to play that file, I'm sending out my NTLM hash for NTLM hash negotiation. So I'm effectively, by setting this reminder sound in the client, or if you were to do it yourself and you want to go play, you can go into a task or to a meeting, or really into any object, and set a reminder file parameter. See that itty bitty little icon with the bell that nobody knows what it is? If you click on that, it lets you sound, set a custom sound file. And you can have it go to any SMB path you want. Um, in talking to the developer of this feature, it's like, God, that's been in here. Number one, it's been in here for forever, like 15, 20 years. And number two is like, well, it's only intended to be set by the end user on their objects. 
We never imagined that anybody would include it in the TNEF file. Hmm. So like I said, we're on these calls with 371 people now, and people are starting to get nervous. But now we understand what's happening. So just to show you a little bit more is like, all I have to do, and this was a simulation to a test server that my friend Rocky set up, I think. Or was it yours, Thomas? I don't know. I think the 51 IP was a VM he had in Azure. So we blacked it out just so you don't go attack his VM. Uh, but um, so really what we were seeing is even if the authentication is not successful, even if no file exists on that file server, you're still leaking the NTLM hash. And the threat actor was taking those NTLM hashes and relaying them. Cause exchange server out of the box will still allow NTLM based authentication. We could see them relay it back into the exchange server. The threat actor could have just as easily, um, you know, just taken that hash and cracked it offline, right? Pretty easy capability for people to do. At that point, they would have a username and password and they're good to go. But they were actually doing a relay attack. And then once they got in, you know, once they got, you know, it were able to get <laughs> an NTLM hash for that user. Now remember, the user didn't have to enter credentials anywhere. They didn't have to interact with the message at all. All they had to do was use Outlook. We're like, wow, this is a really bad vulnerability. We should fix that. One of the other big questions that happened in that SERP process was, OK, is it a vulnerability in Exchange? Is there a vulnerability in Exchange Online? Or is this solely an Outlook client? We were able to say that 100%, no doubt in our minds, it was only a vulnerability in the Outlook Windows client. So that's good. However, well, how do we now eradicate this attack vector from the face of the planet? Because one of the big problems is, well, people knew that their accounts were getting compromised, so what would they do? They'd change their passwords, right? Great. Change the passwords. Doesn't matter. Some of those reminders had recurrence settings on them, or if you didn't dismiss the reminder, the next time you open Outlook, they all fire again, right? And guess what? You leak your new NTLM hash. And now your threat actor, right? So it's it really pretty, pretty cool technique when you think about it. If it didn't ruin Christmas, New Year's, my birthday, a couple of other holidays, I would have really been impressed. Um, but it ruined some of my holidays, and that's really, you know, it really is all about me. That's the way I think about the world. So um, I really wish they'd be more considerate, right? If more people considered how their actions not impact others, how their actions impact me, the world would be a better place. So let me tell you about what we did as a result. So this is how the thing works. And we said, gosh, you know, so TNEF, some good references there. Um, when you receive a message from the internet, your exchange server, as part of the transport protocol, will parse that attachment, the TNEF, and just populate all of the MAPI properties. Exchange Online does the same thing. So one of the things we wanted to do as part of the fix was, number one, we wanted to change it so you will no longer leak NTLM hashes even if you have a poisoned message or a poisoned object in your Exchange store. Okay? Number one, we wanted to eliminate that. The Outlook patch, which we published, did that. But the other thing was, well, OK, so it'll take people maybe some time to get rid of all those messages, right? Or to, I'm sorry, to patch all their end users' Outlook clients. You know, that's kind of hard in some organizations. Might take a week or two or a month. And because once we issue the patch, once we issue the CVE, 
it is trivial to exploit this. And quite literally, <laughs> within about 20 minutes of us going public about this thing, there were test harnesses exploiting this thing. There's, you know, Twitter exploded on it. It was pretty cool to watch. Um, so we knew that was going to happen. So one of the first things we wanted to do was let's also change it so that Exchange Online won't, if it gets this TNEF packet, will not take that property and populate it into Mappy. So we're going to neutralize it when you receive the message. So no new messages coming in. If you patch your Outlook client, you're not going to leak hashes anymore. So we're good. So we had to do defense in depth releases on Exchange Online and on Exchange On Prem. The threat actor, however, um, you know, once they got in, they would go move laterally, right? Because, hey, I, you know, from an outside account, I sent you this thing and nobody bothered. But they would actually go use it to move into other organizations, now they have a compromised account, and to move more broadly across the existing organization. So we saw that. Um, the fixes, as I alluded to, first now what we're going to do, we change the Outlook client that says, hey, um, there's probably some users who actually use this functionality for some real reason. Unfortunately, we have very little telemetry that tells us about end user configurations and how widely the custom sound file is actually used. But we didn't want to break people. We just wanted to break the threat actor. So like we do through the rest of the Outlook client, um, if you were trying to access something you know, like if you have attachments or if you have URLs and things like that, we make different adjudications based on the security zone, the map URL to zone output, right? And if it's on your local network, we still let you access it, right? But if it's out on the internet, we're going to say nope. If it's not in a trusted zone, we just don't even bother trying to render that file now. So that was the fix. The API we used in Windows was map URL to zone, um, which, once again, the, the, high, you know, the, the hive mentality of security researchers started pounding on the fix. And they said, wait, um, there's some ways that you can construct these URIs so that you could theoretically still trigger an NTLM hash leak because map URL to zone says that that thing is on the intranet zone when it's actually an external URI. So we discovered, I believe, three bugs in map world to zone and fixed those subsequently. Like I said, this thing went on a lot longer than I expected. Meanwhile, we also made the other place is, hey, well, what if you're not using an Exchange server, but you're using Hotmail or something out there? It's actually the Outlook client also has a TNEF parser. So if it receives an external message that has this TNEF uh, parameter set, we also basically drop that property. We don't populate it into the Mappy store. So an external message that's trying to set this property. And by the way, we did go through the other 200 and I forget however many properties there are that could be part of extended Mappy and look for anything else that could automatically trigger an, an NTLM hash leak, this was the one. Okay, so we looked for variant analysis. Um, as I mentioned, Exchange Server and Exchange Online were not actually vulnerable. However, they could be really effectively used in the kill chain. Exchange Server, you could just relay the NTLM hash back into it, and unless the customer had um, configured their Exchange Server to not allow the NTLM hash authentication, um, very few places have actually done that, um, then they could get back in and we you know, saw that activity. When we actually, we also did the modification on Exchange Online to just drop that property. But being an incident responder, I know the three questions that every customer on the planet is going to have once we release this. So what do we need to do? 
we need to empower our customers to answer three fundamental questions. Number one, was I targeted? Right? And so how do we do that? Well, I had put together a really, how do I want to phrase this, bad script. <laughs> it wasn't very robust, but I could run it against my customer's environment and find all of the messages which had this offending property, right? I gave that off to our product engineering team and I said, I live in fear of a day when anybody uses code I wrote in a production environment, so please make this better. And they went and wrote a customized script version of this script which would go index an entire Exchange server environment and find any messages which had this PID lid reminder file parameter uh, value set. We re released that out on actually on through the security blog. And that will help customers understand, do I have any messages still in my exchange organization that would indicate that I was targeted? Then the next thing was, am I, was I compromised? Was it successful or not? And the last one was, what was the impact? So what we wound up doing for our customers is coming up, like I said, with this tool to tell you, hey, are you targeted or not? The first version of the tool would take days or weeks to run against a moderate-sized Exchange server. The product team fixed it so it would run in hours. Um, so honestly, even if you, if you just want to learn how to use the Exchange Web Services APIs from uh, PowerShell, great reference there. Show you how to go look at all this stuff, how to use what we call search folders to do this efficiently. Really slick piece of work they did but we knew we had to release a tool like that. Then the second thing was we had to provide people with guidance on how to interpret the data. Either that or I was gonna bury my customer support organization with 10,000 calls of people that found these messages and need to help what, with what to do. So really, you know, one of the caveats here is if you only retain messages for a month or something like that in your Exchange server, if somebody had deleted the message, we don't know if it happened, right? We're only telling you what's currently in the Exchange server. Um, we actually did ask the Exchange Online team, hey, can you scan all of Exchange Online for these messages? And they said, how many years from now would you like that scan to finish? <laughs> there was not an efficient way to do it, so we weren't able to do that for our customers. Uh, but we were able to give them a tool that they could run against their own Exchange Online instance to go find the offending messages. Just scanning the entire planet was probably too you know, complex of a problem. Um, really, was I compromised is for each UNC path, search for any active. So once you get the paths that the server, that, that SMB file path was pointing to, you need to go look in the rest of your telemetry to see if you have anything egressing or you know, going out or coming in from that IP at that particular point in time. That'll be a really good indication of you know, this kind of relay attack. But um, what was the impact? And this is why I should not be allowed to use clip art, by the way. Um, so it really does require a full incident response. I know Microsoft did them. I know Mandiant did some for victims as well. And really, it was just the very basics. But you do see these threat actors going back and, like I said, extending their reach. So once they compromised an identity, once they could get in and send emails as a trusted partner, you know, then they would use that to go send it to somebody else. And like I said, it's not like the end user has to do anything. They just had to open Outlook. That's why this one kind of scared the out of us. <laughs> I mean, when you have something that really enables a credential leak without any <laughs> real user interaction, we have a really big problem. The other thing, though, was what we saw the threat actor do immediately when they got that credential. Initially, it looked like they were doing it manually. So in you know, February, it looked really manual. In March, it looked really manual. By June, when they're hitting this organization really hard, it was fully automated. So get the message, get the TLM hash, log into the account, 
change all, enumerate all of the mailbox folders that can contain emails and modify the permissions on every single one of those folders so that any authenticated user could access them. And then they would change the identity they were using to harvest these mailboxes using cross mailbox authentication, right? And they would change the infrastructure that they used for it over time. So keep your stuff patched. Really good guidance on investigating the attacks. Um, part of the thing, though, with um, when we start up this SERP process is we're told by our legal team saying, hey, you know, don't use dr overly dramatic terms, don't make jokes, don't do any of these things. But I did figure out that I could set my background image in Teams to uh, a variant of the AOL thing, and that did not violate corporate policy, and I could show a little bit of a sense of humor. So that was my background image for a couple of months uh, when I was on a Teams call, and people asked, what's that about? So um, I had to wait until the vuln was public before I did that. But <laughs> So that's where that came from. Here for questions. That's really all I had. And if you could give your name and who you represent as well, yeah. please. We need to get some people some exercise. So the next question needs to come from over there. <laughs> yes. uh, th thank you for the great presentation. I'm, I'm Remy with World Bank here in DC. Uh, the question is, in your recommendation to customers, both impacted but uh, the broader set of customers, uh, have you considered advising them not to allow outgoing SMB traffic that would leak uh, Absolutely. ashes? Absolutely. So the question was, I'm going to repeat it for the audience, is you know, as part of our guidance, did we say, should you limit you know, outbound SMB to the internet? 100%. Um, one of the recommendations we always make and kind of just good security practice. Another recommendation was um, not allow NTLM hash based authentic NTLM based authentication into your exchange servers. Uh, that one could be rather more disruptive to uh, customers and take a little bit more planning. Um, we know a lot of places were targeted that did not allow outbound SMB, so they did not become victims. Uh, but in this particular case, it was kind of a perfect storm for our, you know, for our initial victim and, like I said, about 12 other organizations. One of the other challenges is that we faced is, you know, we talk about watching exploit TV. Up until the time that we released you know, the patches and everything else, really the only telemetry that we had that indicated there was an issue was if the users either opened a support case with Microsoft, or if the victims opened a support case with Microsoft, or they uploaded things up to VirusTotal. None of our other security sensors, you know, were giving us good, reliable telemetry about this particular signal. And even though we could have put more detection in place, um, it took us, you know, basically two months to get the patches ready so we could release everything at the same time. And because we didn't see broad, um, broad use of this vulnerability or any kind of broad knowledge, we luckily felt like we could release everything in a big bang and go ahead and address it that way. There was a one-week delay between when we patched the Outlook client and when we applied the mitigations in Exchange Online. And that was purposeful, because if we would have applied the defense in depth mitigation to Exchange Online, it's not like you can roll out a change to all of Exchange Online in a couple of hours. It takes a couple of weeks to, per to percolate through the entire system. Actually, it only took a week, now I think about it, but it takes a finite amount of time, not zero. We were worried that people would notice that we changed something and then start going and finding the vuln before the clients were patched. The client, patching the clients was the critical piece to stop the loss of data. So that was one of the delays. We have another question in the back. 
Hi, Cody San Juan, NEIC. Um, I was just curious, how did you handle the IP address that you found in Utah? Like, what was the response for the service provider? Um, so Microsoft didn't directly reach out to the service provider. That's a great question. We did provide that information to the CERT in that country. Um, they went through their process. Um, really, when we look at a lot of times these virtual private server vendors and everything else, um, you know, they're not, they're victims as well, right? Typically the services that, you know, a lot of times the threat actor using their service is a violation of their terms of use. We allow them to do that. Microsoft does collaborate quite a bit with law enforcement on investigations. In this particular one, um, because of jurisdiction, we asked the Ukrainian CERT to take that action. So I'm not privy to, were we able to get disk images? Were they able to shut it down? Were they able to get anything else? What we were able to do, though, is based on traffic pattern analysis, we were able to do, or my colleagues in the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center, were able to do attribution based on the infrastructure the threat actor was using once they compromised accounts to say that it was a threat actor, which at that point in time we called Strontium, now we call them Forest Blizzard, because we're Microsoft, we have to change the names every six months of things. But um, basically, Russian foreign intelligence. So Roberta will be available after the presentation for anyone who would like to follow up with additional questions, but please join me in thanking Roberta. Thank you so much.